From the United Nations Office to the African Union, this is She Stands for Peace. I am Dr. Yemisi Akimbobola, and in this podcast, I speak with thought leaders and peace builders who share their reflections and best practices towards achieving objectives of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in Africa. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Speciosa Wandira Kazibwe, former Vice President of Uganda and former Co-Chair of FemWise Africa. Dr. Wandira Kazibwe joins me from Kampala, and we have a conversation about increasing the representation of women and their perspectives in formal and informal peace processes. Dr. Speciosa Wandira Kazibwe, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. So you were Africa's first female vice president and taking on that position um, in a post-war Uganda in 1994. And looking at your political career, I can see that women's rights has been central to your work um, from being the member of the youth and women's wing of the Ugandan Democratic Party to being elected women's representative for Kampala District in the 80s, serving as the Minister of Gender and Community Development in the early 90s. And you also founded and chaired the African Women Committee on Peace and Development in 1998. You were among other women like Betty Bigombe, whom I interviewed um, earlier on in this podcast, promoting women's leadership and gender equality in politics and academia in a new Uganda. You were also at the forefront of drafting uh, the 1995 Ugandan constitution. Now you're a senior presidential advisor on population and health, given your background as a surgeon, and you were previously co-chair of FemWise Africa, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. So in terms of the Ugandan constitution, your taking up of the role as vice president in those post-war years in Uganda, what were those periods like for you? you know, as women in the forefront of that changed environment, that pursuit of democracy, that pursuit of gender equality? I was elected as a village leader, then came up as a district or city councillor, and then I got into the NRC, which is, was the parliament then. And then immediately I became a minister representing Kampala. All the ills of the wars we are written on the face of Kampala. All the institutions, everything. So I, 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 had, I would host the women leaders from all over the country. And uh, we knew we had an agenda because the, 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 the government said, we, you've come in on affirmative action because you are women. So we want to know. So it was upon us to really go out and speak to the women and get their views. So going to writing the constitution in 1994, I was already aware of what the women of Kampala felt, the urban women, because I was a rural bred person. And because we were having meetings with my colleagues, we were able to put together a package of what the women wanted. And we were also looking towards Beijing in 1995. So when I first was minister for industry and technology, deputy minister, then I was promoted to being a full cabinet minister of women, youth, and culture. And these are the people who are really outside the, realm, the realms of government. So what I did, I, I using my portfolio, I mobilized youth as well. I mobilized religious leaders. I mobilized the traditional leaders and the cultural, the, the, the healers, all those people to support me to go to the NRS, uh, to, to the constituent making body. And they did, not in Kampala, but in my rural area. So that platform enabled me as Minister for Women, Youth and Culture, to even move deep in the villages and get views as we were making the constitution. Because whereas there were views collected, the, the views related to a particular portfolio had to be deepened for you to make the case. The case for women participation, 
the case for youth participation, the case for traditional leaders remaining in the constitution. And uh, so that assembly gave me a lot of insight, further insight, in what leadership is all about. It's about pulling the underprivileged up and getting to know what it is they need to know. So in 1993, I mobilized women and were able to get the support of the of uh, uh, UNECA and the OAU and the government of Uganda to hold that regional meeting, which ended up into a declaration, the Kampala Declaration. And that is what jump-streamed me into Africa affairs. So 93, I was writing the constitution. I was minister for women, youth, and culture, and looking at the portfolios. And that's when I became vice president in 1994. I was reading the speech that you gave in Beijing all the way in 1995, and it still gave me goosebumps. And so, so this was at the fourth World Women's Conference in Beijing, China in 1995. And you outlined the significant development that Uganda has made in terms of gender equality, and on the girl child as of that time. And here's what you said, and I'll quote you. You said that the most crucial area is that of functional literacy for the women in the developing world. To make illiterate women history, we must make sure the girl child is guaranteed relevant education to equip her with skills necessary for survival in this competitive world. And then you go on to talk about how important the financial support is to achieving that. And then again, I'll quote you, you said, strategy to end our woes is to vote for capable gender sensitive women and capable gender sensitive men. It is then that we shall stop begging. I mean, those were such powerful words. And I was still a teenager as of the time when you were given this speech in 1995. So fast forward now to 2020 and this notion of intergenerational dialogue and co-leadership with the youth is very much an active strategy to ensure the future of what leaders like you tirelessly advocated um, and continue to fight for when it comes to gender equality, the rights of women and girls, and, and the leadership of women and girls. So Dr. Wandira Kazibwe, how far have we come? And what are the critical things when it comes to these issues that you would want the world to take more serious action on? I think uh, in the beginning, because I have to have a baseline, the baseline was in uh, 1993 at the Kampala Declaration which was adopted by, by the ministers of OAU in Harare. And you know the history. Now, there were four pillars that we wanted to achieve. We want policy. Because without policy, you cannot get governments to move. Secondly, we wanted institutionalizing issues to do with the women. So you can have a beautiful policy and sign the UN declarations, but you don't institutionalize them through your parliament so that they grow and you are able to say, here is a government department to handle this. Here is how women issues will be mainstream. So what are those institutions? The other two were mainly to do with operationalization, doing research. And I want to say that when we started the African Women's Committee on Peace and Development, which nobody talks about, <laughs> not at all, it is only in the archives of UNECA, you know, whatever we are doing, this femwise was envisaged then. And I think that's why we are able to move forward. We said, let's do research on women participation in all development processes, but let's focus on peace because without peace, we shall not be able to develop. Because despite the fact that I left the mainstream of top leadership, the mainstream being at the decision-making table in 2003, I have continued to be an advocate through the people whom we trained to keep everything going. So policy-wise, all the governments in Africa, they have policies on women. 
thanks to the UN. Numbers we have achieved, but the real spirit of moving with the wave, of keeping the agenda high, we have lost. We have all these meetings, but that spirit is not there. Why do I say so? Because we failed to carry on from the mother. Who is the mother? The Pan-African Women, the, 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 Pan, the Pan-African Women's uh, Group. And we kept talking about them. They were part of FEMWISE. They also disappeared. But I'm glad that two years ago, AU has picked them up because they are the ones to keep us African women as Africans. We have to be Pan-Africanist. If you are not Pan-Africanist, you cannot fight for peace in Africa because the battles are everywhere. In health, in agriculture, in industry, everywhere. The annihilation of an African is everywhere. So you must be Pan-Africanist. And as a woman, you must do it with pain because in pain, you will always deliver. So those who are ready to deliver Africa in pain are very rare. It has become issues of, uh, will I be promoted? I can't say that because I'll lose my promotion, because I'll do this and that. So we need to rekindle that spirit. So on institutionalizing and continuing to grow as Pan-African women, women who are Pan-Africanists, we haven't achieved much. But in the numbers, we have achieved. I'll give you an example of my country, Uganda. Do you know that in Uganda, 50% of the judiciary is women? 50%. Yes, 50%. We said, let women, in terms of operationalizing, where are the areas where we are not? Science. Do you know that in Makerere University, the women who get first, the people who get first class in engineering are women? In the medical school, when I was there, we were the first big group of 14 girls out of 120. Now, half the class is women. Surgery, you couldn't do surgery as a woman. Now, over half the classes of surgeons, because I'm a surgeon myself, I'm proud of that. Half are women. So, we have achieved in terms of getting women enter the professions and really do well in school. But the spirit of Africa, which is within us, as the mothers of Africa, is dwindling. The light is being blown side to side, and if we don't do something, it will be blown out. Then we'll just have, why do I say so? If the African languages die out, Africa is dead. And who teaches children language? It's the women. From 1993 up to now, which area have we neglected? We said to get rid of many of these things at the root, we should have women be sensitized about the law and criminal procedure and civil procedure not to just get women women lawyers, because many of them don't practice law. They don't go to court, because court is where things are played out. So now, that is the new, my new agenda. To get women told, how is it, how do you make your case, even in a village court? How do, because all these laws, the village courts, they all work under a constitution. So if the women know the procedures of how to put their cases, whether it's domestic violence, whether it is uh, anything else, then they should be able to fight from the community up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in July 2017, the African Union Assembly of Heads of State and Government established a network of African women mediators known as FEMWISE Africa, which you were a um, former co-chair 
of FEMWISE. And FEMWISE Africa operates within the African Peace and Security Architecture at the African Union as a subsidiary mechanism of the panel of the WISE and the Pan-African Network of the WISE. So considering its focus has been to strengthen the role of women in conflict prevention and mediation, what lessons have you learned through the work of FEMWISE when it comes to successful deployment of women's contribution to negotiations, both for informal and formal at the various stages of negotiation? You see, my feeling is that um, we are like that camel and that man in the desert. We are fighting to get into the tent. Now we are inside the tent. Now we should struggle to look around the tent and see where to sit so that we can be effective at the table. How do you sit and become effective at the table? Now I'm speaking like an old woman now. Because you, yes, because I'm old. I just uh, finished my 67 years on the 1st of uh, July this month. And I say, sometimes if you work like a pinhole surgeon, you'll not see the whole abdomen. Like now we are using this uh, technology. Eh? Uh, uh, now, uh, big surgeon, big incision. That is what peace and conflict resolution is all about. Which means you don't work with the people who have degree in peace or a conflict resolution. You work with everybody. And that's why the policy we left at, uh, I left in place was that we don't only get the peace activists a peace activist is like a leader of peace work. They don't have to be expert at everything, but you get the technocrats in every field to be part of it so that we can be effective even while working with pan wise, which is also another baby of the panel of the wise. So to me, I think that uh, that is where we need to work a lot to make every woman believe like where you are, how do you diagnose areas that may bring conflict in your professional area, which will affect the way people are trained in your professional area or the way they see things in your professional area so that you are able to be part of the whole. Otherwise, Femwise, what it can do at the center is to be a catalyst. If the cause of conflict in DRC is because of uh, timber or trade in gold and whatever, then the women there who are uh, engineers, who are uh, uh, forest experts, they should be the ones we focus on because to convince somebody you must know something and they see you speaking about it from a point of conviction. Not to just say, cutting it easy will bring uh, this and that. Now the, the women are the ones who need firewood. It's a much bigger thing than that. That's why you saw when we were in Algeria, we were saying we want women to now start tackling issues of exploitation of Africa's resources because it's at the core of the conflict we see now. I want to um, dig more into these gaps. Um, so, for example, the UN reviewed 31 peace processes that took place between 92 and 2011, um, 16 of which were in Africa, and they found that only 4% of signatories, 2.4% of chief mediators, and 3.7% of witnesses and 9% of negotiators were women, right? For the five of the 16 African peace talks included in the analysis, women participation was 0% at every level. More recently, um, FEMWISE knowledge exchange session hosted by Accord in October, 2020, Ambassador Jeanette of Algeria said, 
To date, there has been no women-led mediation process in Africa, and yet women are actively mediating at the grassroots level in almost all conflict zones. And you yourself said that we see gaps in policy implementation, gaps in the demarcation of policy commitments, gaps in realizing the ideal of having participation and representation of women in peace processes. Although there has been significant progress in bringing attention to the WPS agenda and its causes, we continue to see small numbers when it comes to women's participation and representation in peace processes as mediators and negotiators. So those were your words in an article that you wrote for Accord. So Dr. Wandira Kazibwe, Considering all the efforts already in place, some of the things, all the things you've said already, um, FemWise Africa, Gender is My Gender campaign, the African Women Leaders Network, Howling, what are your observations on how to improve these gaps? Because it's clear that so much work has gone into it, and yet the gap is still so wide. Yes. You see, I said earlier that we are almost losing out on who is at the table, who is a Pan-African woman and knows what the struggle is all about. Because many times those who get into politics are elected without knowing the agenda. So the training has gone down. So even when they are well-intentioned, they don't have the lenses to see because these inequalities and their perpetuation are very subtle, and sometimes men don't see them either. So you need somebody who can articulate the issues as they are, and to have the data. That's why in 1993, we said we need to do research. And that time, President Gaddafi gave us a building as a peace center for doing research on women. I saw it was bombed during all these things. Tunisia gave us a, he said, Tunisia said they would focus on research in women and law so that we can see how to sensitize women on those civil and criminal procedures you talk about. All those died. When AU came on board, they were all left to, nobody followed them up. So, You need to get women in at the technical level. Women directors of health, women directors of uh, in the army, or commanders in the army, and you get them to be trained on this subtleness, professional area by professional area. We talked about them. I remember I was in Sudan. And they said, but where are the women? Because you see, they put these rules and say, for somebody to go for this peace process or to go in a particular position, they must have worked for so many years. But women are are generals in their homes already (laughs) before they actually get there. You have to start from somewhere. So it is that activism and getting the data country by country and then getting a database of professional women in place, country by country. So when they ask, give us women for this particular area, you already have your database. That's why we started the gender directorate at the AU. Up to now, that database has not been completed. If you don't have that, if you ask me, where is the woman? I will give you a woman. Yes, like when they said, you are telling us you want to head the African Women's Parliament. Give us a, a name. We said, hey, Gertrude Mungela, if she chaired the whole world, how can she chair, fail to chair a few, a, a few men in Africa? Because the women parliamentarians, we are still few. So I think that is the way, and we have to work at it. Because since I joined the mainstream government, it's over 30 years now. Fruits are being realized now. So you have to be systematic, strategic, and to identify the catalytic areas where you must focus for it to have a broader impact 
instead of just wanting to get a, one thing, a small thing here and there. I want to bring us back to Uganda um, because Uganda adopted its third national action plan in 2021, which covers the period of 2021 to 2025. And it was developed through a participatory development process and implemented implementation was also inclusive and localized with people at the center. So very much some of the things that you said in your experience of working from the grassroots up. So Uganda has also been able to mainstream its national action plan with the military, the police, etc. So talk us through the development and implementation of Uganda's national action plan. What has worked, whether it's the current one, the previous two, what has worked? What have you learned? What do you want the global peace and security community to learn from how Uganda did it? You see, I was in the Finland recently at the UN University workshop on implementing uh, that uh, those SDGs 15. And I said, must want something badly for you to get it. So we must want peace badly to get it. So those of us who are children of bad times, we wanted peace badly. So the new, what I see now in the new generation of activists, and they are now working together, young men and young women, there is more the, the, the gender parity in the younger generation and realization that they need to work together, the situation is better among the younger people. But what is it that they want? When you are young, you are just all over the place. Somebody has to help you to harvest that energy and put it somewhere useful. Otherwise, we are going to go back to the times of before. So in Uganda, the plans are always very good, you know. Plans, the plans, we plan. It's the implementation. The work is plenty, but the workers are few. Because before you know it's plenty, you've, you already know what you want to do. So Uganda is very good at making plans for the social sector to impact the well-being of people, but it's the implementation, the implementation. So I say we are ready for another revolution and revolutions need people who are fired with ideas, which are not for today, but for where we are going. That is what it is with the, the, the plan for Uganda. Today, we've talked about the representation of women in peace processes. We've talked about your journey and the need for a rekindling of the spirit for peace, the spirit for change. So to finish off our conversation today, if there was one action that you would like our listeners to take today in relation to all we've discussed, what would that action be? What I would like people to know is that women have come to stay in every field so everybody had better learn how to live with them that's what I want them to take out Thank you so much, um, Dr. Wandira Kazibwe. It's a real honor to speak with you and to interview today. It's been so inspirational to listen to your journey and to really feel the spirit in every single word that you said to me today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best. You have a lot of work, your profession especially. Thank you for listening to She Stands for Peace the podcast series where thought leaders and peace builders share their reflections and best practices in the women, peace and security agenda in Africa. I am Dr. Yemsi Akimbobola, and this podcast was produced by the United Nations Office to the African Union with the generous support of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Don't forget to join the conversation using the hashtag SheStandsForPeace.